Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks for showing up for the last talk of the conference. Um, yeah, so um, I was already introduced uh, here uh, with the title of the talk. Uh, this talk is about um, um, why you should run SQL on Flink and, um, and how you can do that. Um, a few words about myself. Um, I'm a PMC member of Apache Flink. Um, started, well, basically started building up this project since day one. Um, since two and a half years working on the relational APIs of Flink. I'm also trying to write a book about uh, stream processing with Apache Flink. It's going so-and-so. Um, work in progress still. Um, and I'm also a co-founder of Data Artisans, uh, which is a startup founded by the founders of, um, or original creators of Apache Flink. Um, and we're providing the DA platform, which is um, a, a bundle of open source Apache Flink and the um, DA application manager. And the platform basically integrates Flink with, um, uh, and puts it into, uh, into context where you can use it, uh, where it uh, eases the operation, uh, operations of um, streaming applications. So it's integrated with logging, metrics, uh, CI, uh, CI, CD. Um, it uses um, Kubernetes to, to de deploy Flink applications. And the, um, the application manager takes care of the um, managing the lifecycle of applications. So you can um, stop an application, you can resume it, you can scale it out, scale it in, you can update the code, migrate your application to another cluster, and all these things. So, um, for who has heard about the Flash, Apache Flink or now? So, most of you, so I guess I can cut this rather short. Um, so Apache Flink is um, yeah, a stateful stream processor. It covers the full bandwidth of streaming applications starting on the batch side, so uh, processing kind of like um, uh, finite streams, so to say, going to traditional stream processing, but also uh, to the edge of event-driven applications uh, where your uh, applications that consume events and uh, uh, perform certain computations and react on them. Flink has a couple of nice features. It's um, um, as I said, it uh, can process uh, real-time and historic data streams. Um, it is a, a stream processor with a very low latency. Um, it's fault tolerant, so you can get exactly once semantics for your state. Um, it does uh, lots of in-memory processing. It features event time processing, so you can um, really have all the nice semantics in your applications. And it uh, scales very well, so uh, people use it at very, very large um, in very large deployments. So a few of the users here um, are, are fairly big, big enterprises. So uh, we have, for instance, Netflix, uh, which uh, uses Flink to process uh, three trillion events per day, um, has uh, jobs in production with uh, 20 terabytes of state. There's also Alibaba, uh, who built a, a stream processing platform based on, based on Flink. ING is using it for fraud detection. And there are also a couple more users, so, so this is just a selection of where Flink uh, runs in production. Flink has a couple of um, programming APIs that you can use, which are kind of layout. So you can um, start at the bottom end on the, on the process function level, which is um, an interface that gives you um, access to, to uh, control time and state, so which are like the basic basic building blocks for building uh, streaming, streaming applications. On top of that is the data stream API, which gives you nice, uh, nice shortcuts for very common stream processing uh, operations like uh, Windows, uh, window, Windows, for instance, or also uh, doing uh, asynchronous calls against um, external data stores. And finally, on top, there are the high-level APIs for, for uh, streaming analytics. Um, SQL and uh, the table API. And this is also where this talk is, uh, is about. So um, Flink has these two types of relational APIs. There is um, ANSI SQL, so um, standard SQL. We're not using some kind of like um, streamified SQL here. Um, so this is a very simple query which just uh, groups, um, clicks, clicks table per user and computes a count. Um, and then there is the table API, which is a link style API. Link is, uh, stands for language integrated uh, uh, query language. Um, and here you basically embed the query 
in your, your application. So you see you have uh, some kind of a table environment here on which you can call a method scan, and then you say group by select. And this way, you basically build up a query um, that is here is doing exactly the same as the secret query. So both APIs are unified APIs for batch and stream processing, um, for, for batch and streaming data. And this means that a query will Speci or a, a query specifies exactly the same result regardless whether you um, run the query on, on batch data, on a file for instance, or whether you run it on a, on a streaming data such as a Kafka topic. Queries are translated um, in this flow. So um, we, we integrated the translation of the uh, table API and SQL queries uh, into one flow. So um, both query representations uh, are, are translated into um, a logical, logical execution or log logical plan. We're using CalSight for the SQL parsing and also for the logical for the optimization. So, SQL queries and table API queries are translated into a logical plan. Um, then we apply um, optimizations on that, again, using CalSight, the CalSight optimizer. And depending on whether the query is executed in a streaming or in a batch context, um, it is translated into a, into a data set, Flink data set um, plan, which is Flink's uh, batch API, or into a data stream plan for, for streaming queries. So the uh, bottom um, left part, uh, in that case, the data is, uh, is bounded, it's batched. And in the other uh, bottom right part, um, we would create a plan for, for streaming data. So what happens if we now want to run this very simple query on, uh, um, on a table clicks that is uh, rep or wh where the table clicks represents a file? So in that case, we basically read the data from the file. We would give all the data somewhat in, into the query processor and we would get a, get a result. So the data, input data is read once, and the result is also produced at once. So this is like very, very simple, the, the standard way of evaluating queries in, on, on, on batch data. So, but what happens if clicks is a stream? So here we represent it as a, as a stream, could be a Kafka topic, could also be uh, data in Kinesis, or whatever other stream you'd, uh, you, you have. And in this case, this table, of, of course, also has some kind of a schema, but the records appear over time. And as new records arrive, we can evaluate the query and incrementally compute the result of the table. So we got a record here for Mary and another one for Bob. So both counts here are one. If we now get another one for Mary, we can increment the counter for Mary to two. And if we then get another one for Liz, we add another row for Liz. So in this case, the data is continuously read, con continuously ingested, um, and the result is continuously updated. However, in the end, the result in both cases is the same. So we have the same input data, we run the same query, and we get the same result. So why is it important that this, this, this property of um, stream batch unification? So first of all, it's of course a usability issue. If um, uh, since Flink uh, implements ANSI SQL syntax, there is no, no, no custom stream SQL syntax that anybody would need to learn. And there's also no hidden semantics. So we implement exactly the same semantics as you would uh, expect from a, from a batch query processor. Um, this also increases the portability of queries because now you can run the same query on bounded and unbounded data, but also on rec recorded data and on real-time data. So in case there is some kind of outage, you're, um, um, you, you, you stop receiving data or whatever happens, you cannot continue processing the query. You can take exactly the same query and run it on, on uh, the recorded data set again. You can also use this feature to bootstrap state. You can, it's also a great feature if you want to um, explore a data set or um, design a query on a small sample of batch data and later deploy it uh, on, a, on a live stream. But how can we actually achieve this, um, the um, secret semantics when, when running queries on streams? 
Well, that's actually not something that is very new. In fact, database systems do that for, for quite some time. And the um, corresponding feature in, in database terms are materialized views. Um, these, the, this feature, or materialized views, are kind of similar to regular views, but they are persisted in disk or in memory. And whenever the input tables, or the base tables of the view, defini view definition change, they also reflect these updates in the materialized view. So um, if you think about it, the updates to the base tables are like the, uh, the records that you receive via a stream. So that those are the updates. The view definition query is the streaming query that you're evaluating. And the result is the materialized view. So if you think, it, think about it that way, um, like this, this type of incremental query evaluation is, is not that new at all. However, in the context of Flink, we're putting it into a distributed stream processor, a distributed stateful stream processor. This is um, yeah, um, something that um, has not been done so often before. So in the context of, um, of Flink, we have this concept of, of a dynamic table, which is a table that is uh, changing over time. Um, and um, with these dynamic tables, um, you can these, these dynamic tables um, can produce the input as well as well as, as well uh, as the output of a query. So if you have an input dynamic table, you apply a query on it, and then the result of this query will be another dynamic table. So whenever something changes in the input table, these changes will be um, will be reflected in the output table by uh, having an incremental um, query evaluation mechanism. So what does it mean um, for when, when running these continuous queries on, on dynamic tables? Um, where, where, where can I get a, such a dynamic table from? Well, first of all, usually you have a stream that you somehow want to conceptually convert into a dynamic table. And there is different ways how you can translate a stream into a dynamic table and also back. Um, for instance, there are um, append conversions where each record that is sent by the stream is treated as an insert to your dynamic table. So whenever you get a new record from the stream, you just append it to, uh, to your dynamic table. Um, another mode is the absurd conversion where you basically each, um, the, the, the schema of the stream has a certain key attribute. And whenever you get a, get a record, you look up in your dynamic table whether there is already a record with this key, and then you update the record. And if there is no record for such a key, you insert the record. So this is absurd conversion. And finally, the most generic one is the change log conversion, where for each record, you have something like a flag which uh, tells the system, hey, this is a record that you should insert, or this is a record that you should remove from the table. So there is no key involved. There is simply the notion of, hey, add this and remove this. And uh, this way, you can basically, this is the most generic and also kind of like most expensive way of, um, of um, treating updates in a table or treating, treating uh, up generating tables from a, from a stream. Um, but this is very, very, very generic. So um, what kind of operations does, Flink, uh, does Flink, um, support in uh, Flink 1.5, which has been released a couple of weeks ago? So there's, of course, all these uh, simple things like select from where, so projection and, um, and filters. Um, we also support group by and having clauses um, on non-windowed um, on non-windowed uh, group by clauses, but also have these um, shortcuts to define tumbling, hop, and session windows um, in, um, in in the group by clause. There is a, a, a certain subset of joints supported windowed joints where you have a record from one side and you say, hey, I want to join this with everything that is 10 minutes earlier and 10 minutes later in the other stream. Um, uh, these are these uh, window joints that we support. There's also non-window joints. Um, these are joints that typically have to materialize the full table because there's no time time constraint on the table, uh, on time constraint in the, in the join attributes, uh, join predicates, sorry. Um, we support 
uh, quite a quite a few um, different types of user-defined functions. So you can also plug in your custom uh, custom logic into SQL queries. We support Scala functions, aggregation functions, and also table-valued functions. And in the last release, um, we added um, a CLI client to uh, to play around with the API to submit queries um, to a to a Twiffling cluster. There's a few few operations that are only supported in either um, on either streaming data or batch data, such as the set operations, which are only supported in batch at the moment, and um, over windows um, for, for streaming data. So what can you build with these tools at hand or with this feature set of, um, um, of SQL? Well, first of all, you can build, of course, a simple ETL, uh, low latency ETL or data pipelines, where you ingest data, transform it, aggregate it maybe, uh, filter it, and then um, pipe data from one stream into another, or you can um, um, ingest data from a stream, write it into a distributed file system or into a, a database system. You can also use it to, um, to run streamer batch analytics, um, both on historic data, but also on live data using the same query. And um, you can also use these queries to, to power uh, live dashboards. So you basically define a query on a stream that um, generates basically a materialized view, which is live updated as data of, on the stream arrives, and then have a dashboard querying this table and uh, visualizing the data. So I'm going to demonstrate here um, like a, a few queries uh, using this uh, new CLI client. And the data set that we're using is um, the New York, ride, uh, uh, New York City taxi rides data set. Um, we, we stripped it down a bit. So in our case, we only have five attributes, which is um, um, an ID for a ride. It's a start, whether this is an event that represents the start of a ride or an end of a ride. We also um, have the longitude and latitude values for where this event happened. Uh, in case of a start event, this is where the passengers entered the taxi. And in case of the end event, this is where they left the taxi. And then there's also, of course, the time attribute for when this event happened. So if we now ha would like to have this, this use case here, basically we would like to compute uh, for, for every location, every five minutes, the number of uh, taxi rides that um, that, that uh, departed and arrived at a certain location within the last 15 minutes, then this is um, a classical hopping window or um, sliding, also, also, whoops, also sliding window. Um, this is defined here in the group by clause where you say hop row time because we're interested in the timestamp here. Um, we say interval five minutes. So we want to compute every th something every five minutes um, over the last 15 minutes. Um, we are also interested in the number of departing and arriving taxis, so that's why we put the is start attribute flag also in the group by clause. And we are um, grouping on a cell, which we computed using a user-defined function to cell ID, which takes the longitude and latitude, converts that into a, basically in a discretized grid, um, and using that as a, as a grouping key, because if we would obviously uh, group on longitude and latitude, uh, we would not get very meaningful results here. So, um, so we're grouping on the on the on the uh, area here, on the start and on the time using the uh, hopping window definition, and then we say simply um, we, we we also select these fields and um, add a count aggregation that then basically c counts how many taxis uh, arrived or departed at each location within the last uh, every five minutes in the last 15 minutes. Another use case could be to um, to um, join the start and end rides on the on the right ID, and then compute the average ride duration per pickup location. So basically, for each location, we want to, we want to know um, how long does a taxi ride uh, last in average when when it starts at this location. And the query here um, would um, join these two subqueries. Um, again, we're discretizing the, uh, the longitude and latitudes to, uh, to cells here. Um, in this case, we are filtering on is start, so we get all the start events, and we join that with all the 
um, events where is start is false. So these are all the end events. So we're joining the start events with the end events. And the interesting part here is the join clause, um, the, the join predicates. First, we join on the right ID, and then we have an um, have we bound the time on which we want to join them here, where the start time, um, the the end time should be between the start time and the start time plus one hour. So we're only joining. We are assuming here that a taxi ride would not take longer than one hour. And finally, we can compute the. Um, and finally, we can compute the average time by uh, computing the diff between the two timestamps. So, um, with these tools at hand, we could, of course, also um, ingest data from, from Kafka, write it into an Elasticsearch, and then use, for instance, Kibana to just visualize the data, because the query takes care um, that in Elasticsearch we always get, um, get the data aggregated in the, in the, in the right way. So, um, how can you use it? Well, unfortunately, until, until recently, um, all these secret queries uh, had to be embedded in Java or Scala code. So there was no way to simply um, send a secret query to Fl Flink and uh, let it run, the, um, uh, run this query. You basically had to implement a Java class or a Scala class and then um, um, define your query in this class, send it to a Flink cluster for execution. Um, however, this also um, means that, or it doesn't, does not automatically mean, but um, the nice thing about this is that um, the table API and SQL are tightly integrated with the data stream and data set API, so whatever other libraries you're using uh, can, be, can be used together, together with the SQL or, um, or, or the table API. For instance, uh, on, the, on the batch side, you could use the um, SQL API to, um, um, for, for, for ETL to get the data in the right shape and then apply um, a Jelly job on this data. Jelly is Flink's uh, graph processing library. And on the streaming side, you could um, first run a certain pattern using Flink's CP library and then evaluate the result with SQL. However, um, since, um, since uh, Flink 1.5, the community is now focusing a bit more on uh, making the API or easier to uh, easier expose, exposing the APIs uh, to, to, to users in a more and more friendly way. So uh, we're work, now working um, also on catalog services, on better, um, better so for support for table source and table syncs. And this CLI client that I'm uh, going to show you is, is now the first, uh, first version of having, having a tool where you can simply use Flink to analyze your uh, streaming and batch data. All right, so this is now demo time. So um, we can. Can you read that, or should I increase the font size? Better. Okay, just to be sure. All right. So um, so um, what I did here is basically I started a, a few uh, Docker containers, um, a Kafka, uh, a Flink cluster, and also this uh, Flink CLI client. And in the background, there is uh, a thread that pushes data into, uh, into a Kafka topic. So we have here exactly the same table that, I, that I've shown you before. So this taxi rights table with these attributes, a ride ID, is start attribute, longitude, latitude, and row time. And we can simply query that with the most simple query. Checking out what's in there, and so this is now the data that as, as it basically flows into the f um, into the Kafka topic, and here in the Flink Flink Web UI, we also see that this query is now no no running. Um, this is um, the operator that ingests the data from Kafka, and this is the sync that sends it back to the, to the sync, uh, to, to, to the um, CLI client. So we can also do a little bit more fancy stuff. Um, 
simply um, aggregating the data, no per cell ID, it's basically something similar as we've done before. So we say again to cell ID um, to discretize the data, we say count star from taxi rides and group by to cell ID longitude and latitude. And now we see these are the, the IDs of the cells. Um, and now we see how we incrementally compute um, the count. And again, there was, um, there was a query started here, something that looked a little bit more complex. Here we have the uh, source again reading the data. This is um, um, a hash partitioning to send the data to the right grouping operator. Uh, a group by that computes the count, and then again the sync, which sends the data back to the client. All right, so that's um, a nice toy, but can you use it for anything serious? Well, obviously not. This is just a CLI client for, for playing around. You can use it to, to look into the data um, in your streams, but uh, not much more. Um, therefore, the Flink community started this, um, what we call FLIP, Flink Improvement Proposal for a query service. And um, we envisioned this to be uh, a REST service where you could submit queries to and um, submit and manage secret queries. So select queries, um, queries that directly write into a new, into a new, into a new table using insert into select. Um, and it should also be able to serve the results of a SQL query back. And this is actually uh, basically where the difficult, uh, difficult parts here start. It should also um, integrate with uh, table catalogs like um, edge catalog or uh, uh, schema registries. And the use cases for, for such a service that you, where you can basically send SQL queries to uh, using REST and then either directly receive the data or write, into, write it into, um, into, into another storage system would be either data exploration using notebooks like uh, Apache Zeppelin. Um, you can get real-time access to data uh, in your application um, and also uh, be able to easily route data from one, one uh, topic to another or um, have an easy way to, to define ETL, ETL pipelines. The challenge here is basically the, uh, the, the serving of these dynamic tables, the tables that are dynamically updating, right? So um, because um, unbounded input also means unbounded results. Whereas in the, in the batch case, serving bounded results is not that hard, right? You have the results, you send it back, and then you're done. Of course, these can also be very large. But in principle, if you're, if you're working on a stream, they're, uh, they're actually unbounded. And depending on the query, um, returning results can be either very hard or not that hard. If you look at the query on the left-hand side, which is a simple, uh, simple select from where query with a simple filter, this query, if applied on a, on, a, on a stream with an append table, would result also in an append result table, right? So you would only get new records appended to the result. And in this case, um, the results rows that you've emitted will never change. And therefore, you can, the, the, the challenge is in um, basically buffering the records um, until they're consumed from the, uh, read from the consumer. Whereas in the other head side, like this is the query that we had in our example, a group by query with a, with a count aggregation, we have a table that is continuously updating. And in this case, um, we somehow need to be able to tell the consumer downstream that, that the results uh, did change, right? And the result table also needs to be maintained somewhere. So serving these results in the, in, in, on, on, on streaming queries, on continuous queries, is, is a little bit difficult. So the design that we um, envision for this query service looks, looks like this. So we have an application uh, which uh, uses REST uh, to communicate with the query servers, which is in the middle. The query service, again, has a, has a REST interface. It has a catalog to, um, to which um, it, uh, that, that can be connected to an external catalog. Um, it also has, obviously, the op optimizer to, to uh, optimize the query. 
and a component that we call here result server. When you have a query, the application would submit the query uh, via REST to the, to the uh, query service. Um, the optimizer would then compile the query into a streaming job, submit it to the Flink cluster. It would start the query on the Flink cluster. This is uh, typically this is a stateful query, st stateful, uh, stateful streaming job. So it would read the data from an event log or a database or whatever, and then write the data again into an event log or database. And from there, the query service would fetch it and serve it back to the application. So in this case, all the results are served by a REST. So this is a very nice property if you're uh, in, in, in uh, certain cluster environments. However, um, in this case, all the data flows through the result server. So this might, in this case, the query service might become a bottleneck, right? Uh, depending on how many queries you start or run, uh, reading all the data, all the result data from a Kafka topic or from a database and serving it back to an application um, might not work so well. Um, because of that, we also uh, thought about a solution to this, to this problem. Again, we could submit a query to the query service. The query service submits the job to the Flink cluster on the left-hand side. The data, again, flows in some kind of a storage system. Um, but instead of returning the result directly from the query service, we return a certain uh, result handle. And then there is a serving, li serving library in the application that could then connect to, uh, to the storage system and fetch the data from there and uh, serve it directly within the application. So um, all of these design decisions are not final yet. So if you have, uh, have a good idea uh, or a certain feature that you would like to have, um, for such a query service, let us know. Um, as I said, the effort is called uh, FLIP24, um, and uh, we're happy to hear your, uh, your ideas about this feature. So to summarize, um, unifying batch and stream processing is important um, for, for, var for various reasons. First of all, uh, being able to use the same query um, on streaming and batch data makes it makes it very portable. You can just, if something goes wrong, run it on uh, on historic batch data as well. Um, Flink SQL solves many of the streaming and batch use cases. It runs in production at Alibaba, Uber, and and others. So th these companies build um, um, internal platforms which are powered by Flink SQL, and um, the community is working currently working uh, on improving the the user facing side of these uh, of these features. Um, I'd also like to mention there is the Flink Forward conference happening in September, beginning of September, exactly here at Kulturbrauerei. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, sign up early. Um, early bird prices are still available until uh, June 22nd. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Small uh, promotion of my book here as well. You can get it on early release of O'Reilly already. Um, and yeah, thank you. There are questions. Let's take them. We got some time. Here you go. Hi. Um, from what I understand, when you do uh, like grouping by something, right, uh, and then you need to maintain a state of every aggregate. For some aggregates, like average, you need to maintain like intermediary aggregates, like denominator and numerator, basically. Uh, can you access those as well, as a user? N with what kind of aggregates? So, so let's say that you are calculating like arithmetic mean. Yeah. So you, from what I understand, you have to maintain like um, intermediary buffer yeah. for the denominator and numerator, right? Uh, can you access those as the user as well? You can, um, you can certainly do that. Um, it's not very efficient, let's put it that way. So the way this works um, in, uh, in, in, in Flink, exactly as you said, you have to maintain all the state. And since this is an incremental, incremental um, operation where you can also potentially have, have need to remove something from aggregation again, um, you need to maintain basically all the values. That is true. Like for, for if, if you want to want to compute the mean, you have to put all the values into state. This is a very expensive operation in this case. Yes, but it's 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 possible. You can do that. 
but it uh, consumes a lot of state. Any more questions? Far big red. Hi. Um, for the user interfacing, have you uh, given any thoughts of uh, having a, um, a driver um, being available as interface, like JDBC? Um, the, uh, yes, we thought about that. The problem with the JDBC, or having like, so the problem with the JDBC is that it works well for, for bounded data sets, right? As soon as you have to update a result, this does not work so well anymore. Also, I mean, unbounded returning, un like a table that is unbounded, a pant might work because you just have an infinite result set where you can just fetch data from. That would certainly work, that, that we could do, but it would uh, fail for certain queries that do, for instance, um, like, like this uh, group by user count query. Um, at that point, JDBC is not, is, is not working anymore, and we would have to come up with something on our own, yeah. One question on the left, front. Fabian, great talk. I have one small uh, problem with it, which is that I think SQL sucks. Is it just, <laughs> my, I'm at fault, or does SQL have fundamental flaws in this world? Um, yeah, so I mean, SQL, SQL has its problems, yeah. Um, that's why we also have the table API, so, uh, which is um, like a, a more uh, embedded way of specifying your your, your query. So um, both APIs are basically um, are, are equivalent since since we're they're, they're going through the same translation paths, right? So we have um, if, if if you know such a fan of like specifying your queries as a as a uh, as a as a string and putting them into an application, which I also think is not the nicest way to to do to do it. Um, you can also use um, as I said, a table, uh, the, the, the table API, and then compose it with methods um, in an incremental way. And when you, if, 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 if we look at the example that I had here, um, it also solves this, like, what some people, wait, where is it? Consider as, as an issue with SQL, where you have to read basically the, um, the, the, the query from the middle, down and then up, so parsing the query is not that simple, whereas in this case, you can basically start from the top, you say, okay, I scan my data, I group it, and then I project it instead of, hey, where does my data come from? Oh, it comes from the middle, and then, okay, I do a group by, and then I jump to the top to see what I get. Um, yeah. Uh, kind of following up on the past two questions, uh, you showed the SQL interface and the REST interface and those are very popular ways of consuming data. There's a large ecosystem that's been built over the past decades uh, with many providers who, who consume relational data this way. Are you working with any of the established players for, for dashboards, for BI tools? Um, not yet, so we're not there yet, so. Um, oh, SQL okay. might suck, but it's a significant market space and I don't see it shrinking. Yeah. Where's my? No, we're not yet. So um, the the idea here would be to um, probably integrate here at that point um, when you basically return a result handle and then have basically have a, have a query that consumes from Kafka, writes the data into like a relational database, and then when you return the handle, you basically um, say, hey, this is the table, this is the JDBC connection on which you can fetch the data, and then um, a dashboard solution could use this JDBC connection to interactively run queries on the data that is uh, updated while the, query, while, the, while the continuous query runs. Um, makes sense from uh, what, what, what I see. Uh, many applications are now not producing and consuming applications, but there are IoT applications that put data inside, and then there are others that read. So, yeah, not what has been done by a JDBC both ways uh, is now done decoupled. So it makes yeah. sense to think about how to uh, take those apart. Yeah. Any more questions? There's one left middle. Hi. Uh, 
what I don't really understand. So if Flink is fed by a stream of data, right, and these queries can be submitted ad hoc, how do you know how much data you have to preserve in, in Flink? Because it's very different if I'm asking you only about the last hour, then you can drop a lot of data out of the state, but if the next user asks you like for a count since the dawn of the data, then you already have lost all of it, right? Yeah, so um, this kind of depends on the, um, on the way that a table would be defined in Flink. So usually, um, if you, for instance, if we take the example of a, of a Kafka topic, right? Um, the data is in Kafka, and then uh, when, you, when you define the query, you can say, hey, I want this table to be uh, represented uh, by reading from the beginning, or you say, hey, I want to start at the offset um, from, from the current offset, so to say. Um, if you then, the, 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 the proper way of restricting your data then, if you say, okay, I want the data from the beginning, from the early on, or at least as long as I have it in Kafka, the, the, um, then you don't have to do anything because the, the table is defined as starting from the current offset. So it goes on from there. And if you say, hey, I want, only want the first day, from, from the first record, the first day, then you basically have to set something like a, like a predicate where um, my row time is smaller at as this timestamp, and then it will automatically cut it off at that point. All right, let's take one last question from here. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, the, uh, I understand that the windows uh, on the bounded, on, on unbounded streams must be different, but uh, the meaning of a window in, in, in SQL has a very specific meaning, which is bound, uh, bound to bounded uh, uh, set. And so, uh, but now it seems to me that if you use the same term on unbounded streams, uh, that the meaning a little bit changes. Mm -hmm. Why did you uh, choose to use the same term instead of another, which um, it, uh, easier to yeah. to confuse both? Yeah. So um, we we're kind of like distinguishing. Um, so you're coming from the from the SQL windows that you use, like an over clause, right? So yeah, we we d we tend to distinguish them by over windows and group by windows, basically to specify. At which, at which place uh, there are used. If you if you use like a group by window, which is one of these tumble, hop, or session, you basically um, this is a constraint how you group your data. So it's like actually a grouping. And we use like an over window. We also suppose those are a subset of those. Um, then you define the window in the over clause or in the window clause and use the reference in the over. So we support both of them, but um, yeah, on the other side, we, 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 these these group by windows, or we we call them group by windows. Our group by windows are like very, like what people coming from the stream processing space usually understand as windows. So it's kind of like a like a trade-off, like to get both communities somehow um, in the, on, on on the same semantics, and that's why we call them the one windows group by windows and the others over windows. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> All right, let's thank the speaker again.